Let us buy a whole bunch of outreach and chairs. So. <laughs> I'm just asking. University of Montana already did. <laughs> it's gone. It's gone. It's gone. <laughs> but um, thanks for having me. My name is Phil Matson. I'm with the Flathead Lake Biological Station. Um, and I'm going to briefly talk about eDNA. I don't have a lot of time. What time are we cutting off? Oh, you've got and a half hour. Yeah. Or actually, you know what? We're. 20 minutes late, so. so <laughs> I had 20 minutes to do it really fast. It doesn't look fast. Um, thanks for having me. There we go. I am, like I said, with the Flathead Lake Biological Station. We are the second oldest biological station in the lower 48. Um, we're shy by one year, I think, and that's Ohio State. What does Ohio State have to do with lakes anyway? <laughs> but, um, we have a three-pronged mission. We do a lot of education. We teach college credits during the summer. We offer up to 18 college credits. Um, I wouldn't recommend taking all 18 in the summer, but we do a lot of research, obviously, and outreach to the public. Um, and the outreach part is what I really love to do. This has a lag time, so bear with me. There we go. I am also the GIS database manager for the Crown Managers Partnership. Crown Managers Partnership spans, this is just a geographic region representing BC, Alberta, and Montana. We have um, Waterton uh, National Park people. We have Alberta Fisheries, um, National Park Service from Glacier National Park, the university system, a lot of state agencies, but right now we're kind of missing this big chunk from BC. Historically, we had some representatives joining the Crown Managers Partnership, um, specifically from the Tanaha Nation. Yes, a question. Aren't you, I heard that you're kind of having the uh, annual meeting here in September, October. October. Um, to be large, but yeah, to so we we do an annual forum, and it was going to be on fire this year in British Columbia. I think it was going to be here in Cranbrook, maybe Fernie, but the furlough just kind of pushed all of that away. So we're rescheduling for next year. Yeah, I think it's still. The year thing because so for those shut down, the government shut down. Yes, the government shut down. Um, just kind of all of our U.S. Forest Service guys who were part of that fire forum, they weren't working, they weren't checking emails, so we just had to forego that, unfortunately. But we'll pick it back up. And thank um, you, but, Phil. Phil's going to host a, a conversation at, at, later this afternoon, so that's a great time to get engaged in conversation. So, yeah, pardon me. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Help me streamline this. Uh, all right. So we're just going to talk about eDNA real quick. Every living organism has DNA, right? We slough it off with our skin cells, our fingernails, our feces whatever every living organism has it so we can swab the air for viruses we can swab the air for you know, bacteria what is really cool right now is we're finding that these sources of dna and i don't know if you can read this i apologize um, there are certain environmental stressors that will release certain types or um, of rna so during metabolism, for example, a uh, species might, if they're stressed out, they might slough off a whole bunch of cells. Or if they're reproducing, they're sloughing off different types of RNA cells. And so <clears throat> there's a new technology called, uh, what's it called? It has something to do with RNA. RNA is very short-lived in the environment, so half an hour, to a day maybe, 
So when people find this RNA evidence, they know that it came from a living being an hour ago. Whereas with the PCR technology that we're using right now, if you find some DNA, it doesn't necessarily mean that it came from a living being. Okay. So when we are specifically looking at um, tristinid muscles and flat head leg, if we find a positive detection, we can't go to the state agency and say, hey, this lake is contaminated with zebra mussels because it might not be from a living organism. It can be from a dead mussel on somebody's boat that just kind of washed off. It could come from a bird you know, contaminating the lakes and whatnot. So there's different sources, and given that, you have to... Um, this is pretty jumpy here. Yeah, she goes back. Yeah, can you just do that for me? Back, oh, you're good. There we go. So DNA, when you find it, um, it is temperamental. It can break down really fast. Typically, it, it stays in the environment for two days to maybe seven days. However, if, there's, if it's in cold water, it might last a lot longer. If it's hidden in sediments, it could last thousands of years. Okay, so just because we find some DNA doesn't mean we found a species, okay? We have to use logic to kind of, you know, tell managers what is going on, all right? Because managers, when they see um, a positive detection of a dracinid muscle in their lake, they're going to freak out, right? Because that means close that lake down. And then that means pissing off a whole bunch of people. So you can't make rash decisions like that. The managers are relying on the scientists to, you know, give them some kind of common sense. Let them know, hey, it might not be, it could be, we just have to tie in a whole lot of factors. So. Just keep it in mind, the sensitivity of DNA and its persistence is a clue to helping us um, make better management decisions. Next slide, please. So at the bio station, we are um, specifically using the eDNA technology for invasive, <coughs> aquatic invasive species. And we, Primarily, we'll use this plankton toe net sample. And this is a six foot long net. It's just about 30 centimeters wide. And we collect thousands of liters of water. Um, just because you need a better spatial resolution to find DNA in a water sample. Okay? DNA is ubiquitous, it's everywhere. But it doesn't mean that we're going to find it right here. You know, water currents are going to push things away. There's upwelling, there's downwelling. So you have to really have a good spatial resolution to be able to do this. Another way that people do it are just with little small graph samples. So instead of um, sampling with a big net, just one area collecting a large volume of water, they can go out with this little handheld deal and sample lots of lots of water which is, gives you good representation, but you're collecting a small water sample, you may or may not find DNA in that. So there's always some sorts of trade-offs. There's a, we have aut autonomous samplers now that just automatically will suck up water and run it through a PCR machine. That saves a lot of manual time, but at the same time, you still have to have a guy pushing the buttons. Next slide. Oh. <laughs> PCR, sorry. PCR is polymerase chain reaction. And so that's a technique for, yeah, if this girl is swabbing for the brain eating amoeba. Okay, so the DNA is everywhere, right? It just depends on how you collect it. <laughs> um, so polymerase chain reaction. This is a technique that was developed 30, 40 years ago, um, surprisingly, by a guy on an acid trip. <laughs> Seriously, 
But it's a way that they, they heat up DNA, they split the two strands, and then they can lay um, what they call a polymerase on it, which is a, it's a sequencer. And then they cool the DNA together to get these strands, and then they run it through a PCR machine. But I think I'm getting to that in a little bit. What we are doing at the bio station um, is specifically looking for dracidic muscles right now. In 2016, they showed up two and a half hours away from Flathead Day in the Missouri River drainage. Um, and we are fighting really hard to keep the muscles from getting into the pulmonary basin. We have found out that there's different places that we want to try to sample. Um, up at the surface, there seems to be a lot of DNA evidence that just kind of floats around. And then there's some DNA that sinks down to the bottom. But there's also this little cool spot right here, the thermal fine, um, that we like to target as well. But if you look at these two little samples right here, this one's a deep sample. So that's something that we collected deep down there. This one's a surface right up at the top. And you can tell a little differences there. And we're working on um, testing our assays to see where we might find the most DNA. We're trying to find where the best spots are, you know, to, to sample. Next slide, please. One place that we found is the thermocline. The thermocline is this dense layer of, you got the warm water above and then there's cold water. And this dense layer, you can actually see it on, on radars. Um, the DNA kind of settles down and it just kind of collects right here. This dense water, it won't pass through. So it, this is a pretty cool thing that researchers are finally finding. Can I ask you a really good question? Um, you're looking for a particular kind of DNA though. Would you be looking in different places for the like now you're, you're focusing on muscles. Yeah. So if you were looking for the DNA of a different species, mm -hmm. would you be looking, would it be found somewhere different? More? Could, yeah, depending on what it is. Yeah, because some species have at. quite a bit different Absolutely. DNA, so right? uh, the lake trout that are invasive to us, they like to hang out here. So we probably sample more down there. Okay. Mice and shrimp, another, um, invasive species for us. At night, they like to hang down here, and then, or at, yeah, during the daytime, they like to hide out deep, and then at nighttime, they come up. So, you know, those are two different areas that we can serve. It's just that common sense factor. You know, you have scientists who are developing the technology, they're not biologists, and then the managers, they're not scientists, you know, they're trying to interpret the data, the results, and they're like, what's going on here? What does this mean? And so I'm kind of caught right in the middle, which is a really neat place to be um, because I, I ended up here on the Columbia Basin Watershed Network. Um, I don't have a PhD. I'm no expert by any means, and I certainly disclaimed that to Kristen when she asked me to be on the on the board, but it's a practical experience, right? And that's very valuable. Next. All right, so what about eDNA? Um, it's really good right now because there are standards, standardized protocols now. Everybody used to collect things differently. Um, everybody used to process the DNA differently. And now everybody's kind of getting together and it's really helping the uh, managers make better informed decisions. Because before they were, you know, just kind of scratching their heads. How did you come up with this? One lab might have one set of results and then another lab will have a different set of results. They're different results because they're using different tests, they're using different methods, and that just confused the product out of management. But now it's been standardized, and so we're getting more comfortable with it. It's non invasive. We don't have to see the, um, the specimen, right? We don't have to go collect a rare animal and put that 
life in, in danger to know that it's there. It's very sensitive, it's very powerful, it's rather cost effective. Um, samples only cost about $100 to run. Um, and you can do this all year round. The state of Montana, for example, when they're looking for their zebra mussels, they can only, their technique for finding the zebra mussels is by looking at the villagers, which are the larvae, the baby from these guys. And they only spawn when the water reaches a certain temperature. So maybe they can only sample for these villagers two weeks out of the year. Whereas with the DNA, we can, that DNA is always there. So in the middle of winter time, we can go out and sample. When it's you know, cold, we can still find these. Next slide, please. So that's a great advantage to the real DNA. Um, downsides to the DNA is it's really easy for cross-contamination. You can see right here, there's just, there's contamination going on right there. Um, so if you are in a spot where you, ha you have dracinid muscles, you have to wipe down your equipment with bleach all the time before you can go sample somewhere else. Because otherwise you carry that thread of dipping your net in one source and carrying it over here. Number one, you'll get a false positive, and number two, you might actually be spreading the AIS. Um, there's things called inhibitors that are found in the sediment. Um, so if you're collecting a water sample and you get a lot of mud or a lot of clay, you might not get a good reading because that DNA binds to the inhibitors, to the clay, and your PCR machine won't be able to find um, There's always errors because these PCR machines are so sensitive. Um, you might get false positives, you might get false negatives. So it's just a lot of, um, you know, working on some of these kinks with the managers, and there's always going to be skepticism. How can you believe in something that you can't really see? You know, and that's why the state managers like to see the babies they can physically see. It. You know, the DNA, uh, what does that mean? We don't really know. Next slide, please. Um, polymerase chain reaction. This is where they're taking the samples um, and then they're, they're splitting the DNA with heat and then they cool it and they heat it and then they cool it and they go through this cycle about 90 different times. Um, and then every time that the, the strands get split apart, there's this primer. The primer is it's already a whole bunch of mix of the T, A, C's, and G's that are um, specific to a particular species. Okay, so there's a company that you can actually order um, the DNA sequences from for every species in the world. It's amazing. It's just, it's blowing my mind. Um, next slide. And then there's this next generation sequencing, uh, metabarcoding, where they can just run a sample of water and find everybody's DNA. And the stream project is doing something like that. And they're not necessarily looking at every species in the world, but they're using the advice of their biologists to say, hey, there's going to be X amount of species in this stream. Let's look at all of those species that could possibly the Living Lakes is, is working on that, and any groups that are um, collecting have in data and want to do DNA barcoding, if they have one collect sample to do DNA barcoding, um, they can get the samples analyzed for free through um, the stream project. So there are handouts in the front. You can grab one, write in, and the whole program is working with the top. So if you wanted to get barcode to do DNA, Polymerase chain reaction sampling down at your cabin site. And you can do that for that. That's good. <laughs> I'm going to take advantage of it. <laughs> 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 awesome. Next slide. Um, so, the wave of the future. There's this 
technology called CRISPR-9, where they can do gene modification. Scary stuff, but um, pretty useful if we can get things right. They're already using this CRISPR to make mosquitoes sterile, and they're hoping to do that with um, the male muscles as well. So basically what this is, is this case nine enzyme comes from a bacteria and the bacteria can bind to the DNA. You can program this thing to target a specific location on your DNA strand to break that DNA apart. And then they can either put a new slice of DNA onto it to change the gene's expression. Okay, so we can turn on or off sterility. Um, you know, they can do that with, well, the Chinese are doing that to produce embryos that don't have birth defects. You know, I mean, it's great, it's got great positive um, possibilities, but it's scary stuff. And, I don't know how you guys feel about it, but. Oh, nothing is going wrong. But the point is, it's powerful stuff. It's got great potential. And if we can get some R&D money to further this technology, that'd be great. But, you know, the state of Montana, they're not giving money for R&D. They don't give us money to develop our machines. They're giving us a little bit of money to go sample by that rate, to do more with less. You know, they don't fund our overhead. It's like, oh my God. Um, but it's great stuff, and I hope um, traction gets picked up. I certainly have to thank all the collaborators that have helped us Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. They're all up there, I'll let you read it. Um, and then all my sampling crew. Next slide, please. All of those guys. Um, what's really cool though about our program is we're working with the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes, who um, we are actually on the reservation lands, and they come out with a lot of student interns and a lot of student staff. Um, so there's a lot of great collaborations going on. We're developing a lot of young people, um, a lot of future leaders to help serve the monitor and take care of our water, so it's great. Next, I think we're done. Questions? Can you share any sure? slides with us? Yeah, yeah, we have these slides for sure. Yeah, it was a really quick overview. I had 20 minutes, a lot of professional sciences. <laughs> but I mean, I know there's a lot of questions and I'd be happy to answer them.